What a wonderful way to start the day with impact. I want to express my gratitude to everyone for joining our inaugural Impact Friday event. I'm Charlene Bornea, your 2022 GFG Action and Accounting Manager. It is my great honor to welcome you today on behalf of the Giving for Good International team. We're excited to announce that our second annual Giving for Good Action under the theme Healing Our Home, our, our shared calling, kicks off this Sunday, July 17th and caps off on July 31st. Women's Federation for World Peace Internationals signature project, Hearing for Good, aims to conserve the earth and all life by funding sustainability initiatives and empowering each, of, each one of us to take ownership over healing the planet, our home, through a circular fashion. Today's Impact Friday event focuses on one of the WFWPI's advocacies, permaculture, a universal and hopeful practice for building back better. To get things started, let's watch Ms. Yanis, Yanni Duda's Regenesis project, the WFWPI's implementing partner of our permaculture literacy and practice project. Mako, could you please share the video? Aye, 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 ugaya Kalayaman, ugayam kalayaman What is nature? Nature was the Garden of Eden, a place of perfect harmony and abundance. But in man's pursuit of progress, we have also destroyed Should we still stay our current course? Or should we carve a new path? This is the story of our return to Eden. We are writing a new chapter for humanity. where we learn to tap into the ancient wisdom and knowledge to live in perfect harmony and balance with all living things. And what will it take? What would it look like if we finally find our place in nature's perfect design? We could grow food in a way that increases fertility of the land, not deplete it. We could create livelihoods that replenish the earth, regenerating land and people. We could create settlements that make landscapes better than it was before. We could travel and create beautiful experiences in a way that leave a positive impact. And we can transform education to touch minds and hearts and create a legion of change makers, leaders, and restorers with the wisdom and knowledge to enact change and healing. And we could do this place by place, region by region, healing nature through people, healing people through nature. And more than restoring land, we will restore our connection to land, our connection to each other, our connection to self. So that in this journey towards healing the earth, we find healing for ourselves. We call for a different kind of revolution. 
not of anger or fear, but of hope and love. We are no longer fighting the old. We are already building the new. Wow, that was such an inspiring video. I wanted to introduce our deputy, our director for the Women's Federation for World Peace and our overall project manager, Ms. Marley Berlan, who will give the vision and the projects of uh, giving for good. Hello, thank you, chat. Thank you, uh, everyone, for joining us. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, yes, today is Impact Friday. Thank you so much, Charlene, for putting together, uh, organizing this Impact Friday. And I want to thank Dr. Nihal Mayor and Professor Mohammed for joining us. And um, indeed, I really feel that there is hope, although when we observe and when we look around the existential threat uh, that we are living in right now is grim. But when I see young people coming together in this platform and so many young people all over the world investing their hearts and dedicating their, their talent to heal to heal the planet so our theme actually is um uh, healing our home our shared calling and this is uh, our giving for good campaign theme and uh we we would like to uh, promote this and we would like to um, give this energy of positive and hopeful energy for young people out there to join us. And uh, we have our auction coming up and we would like to introduce to you the projects that Giving for Good, the Women's Federation for World Peace International has launched. And I'd like to share with you just very quickly what we have been doing since we launched our Giving for Good project last year. Let me just share very quickly. Okay, so here um, I'd like to show you pictures of our 12 Giving for Good projects in 11 countries. In Albania, we have the Reduce, Reuse, Recycle campaign. Um, it is on the theme Save the Environment and Save the Future. So um, with what they do is they um, sell, they create um, handmade tote bags made, uh, and made with donated clothing. And for Brazil, we have clean water for families in the Amazon. Um, in January 2022, the project was able to donate clay filters to 200 families to give them access to clean drinking water in the families along the riverbanks of Amazon River. And then um, for Burkina Faso, we have environmental awareness and call to action involving the younger generation, elder generation, locals and officials. The committee organized three planting activities for everyone to come together to act for change. And uh, for Cameroon, we have the awareness to environmental action. Um, although raising environmental awareness is not easy, uh, the young people like Tong Il, a youth volunteer of the project, find it excitement in thinking of the future generation acting better to help them to live in a healthier future. And uh, we have Ghana, the School Mobilization for Responsible Consumption and Production. Um, 
Ghana's project aimed to educate the future leaders of the world and the importance of responsible consumption and production. So we have reached out to nearly 1,000 uh, young, young uh, students. And in Mali, we have um, Let's Improve the Life and Health of Families with Solar Lights. Um, we have donated uh, Six, 2000, we have donated to families, 150 families in, um, in, in Mali, uh, 16 villages and about 2,000 people. We have uh, given them the alternative to, to uh, electricity, which is the solar lighting. And then in Paraguay, we have Cubierta Roga Tire House Project. Um, WFWP volunteers worked together to paint tires and transform them into planters that were used to enhance the recreational park in the community. These are using these old uh, used tires. And then we have in, in South Africa, in Lempopo, we have Cloth Nappy Green Project. WFWP volunteers, mothers and children gathered to kickstart the Cloth Nappy Project to promote reusable cotton diapers, which are much more cost efficient and environmentally friendly than the single use diapers. And then in uh, another project in South Africa, in Soweto, we have the Giving the Gift of Light. It's a, another solar lamp project uh, to alleviate this the problem of electricity in remote areas wfwp soweto distributed 130 solar lamps while conducting talks and workshops to help shift from carbon emitting energy to renewable energy and in zambia we're combating deforestation by planting trees uh, zambia's project select the deforested areas in the need of revival and together with women's federation volunteers and local community members 2000 pine tree uh, seeds were uh, plant germinated and planted and in these areas and in philippines we have the permaculture education center and uh, we are partnering actually with the regenesis project for permaculture literacy and and practice program it is going on in philippines um, at the moment and also in Kenya, we have the, another solar energy for African villages. Um, so kerosene lamps pose high health risk to people and the environment. As a, a solution to this issue, Women's Federation volunteers distributed solar lamps as much as a much greener and safer alternative. The Green Solar Energy for African Villages project lit, lit up over 100 homes. So. Um, yeah, that is our projects. And uh, with this, we hope that our Giving for Good auction, um, we can continue and sustain these projects and benefit more countries and expand uh, more awareness, um, bringing the planetary, the level of planetary problems to our homes, to our neighborhoods, and having people practice it through our advocacy and our funding of these projects. Thank you so much. And um, back to you, Charlene. Let me just unshare. Okay. Wonderful projects, Atemurli. I can't wait to support the GFG auction, knowing that these these the funds that the proceeds that are coming out of this auction are straight away funding the 12 sustainability initiatives. And it can be even more if we if we even get to the goal that we are trying to achieve. So I'm really excited for everyone to um, participate in our GFG auction. We have, we're gonna start a discussion and uh, we have two prominent um, guests that are here with us today. Um, Dr. Nihal Mayur. So Dr. Nihal Mayur is an international development expert and a global citizen who has been working on a sustainable development goals 10 years of untiring passionate journey 
includes working from ground level of implementation to capacity building, research, need assessment, and designing the framework for public policy. Dr. Nihal Mayor is recognized for his experience of working from disaster zones to refugee camps and from committee negotiations on social development and to be an observer at the United Nations General Assembly. Thank you, Dr. Nihal, for being here with us for today's event. Thank you for the... <laughs> Thank, thank you for a great uh, introduction. And I'm very thankful to all of you for inviting me here. And without wasting our precious time, because uh, as we are talking somewhere, somewhere deforestation is happening. So yeah. uh, for, for good, uh, I'll begin with a quote of uh, Ban Ki-moon say, stating we don't have planet B, so we do not have plan B. As simple as that, the known fact that what's happening around deforestation, uh, we are living with the limited finite resources and all the resources what we are using right now is for the fifth generation after us. So we are already 200 years of ahead using the resources. So the project what, uh, uh, what uh, WF, WP has been uh, working on is excellent. And uh, I would like to add few of my best practices, what we've been practicing in a uh, rural part of India and uh, in Southern African region. So uh, like the source of, we have only source of water is rain. Once we catch the rain, it can be stored in form of river, in form of well, in, in form of uh, a storation for water. But what happens when these store is empty? It's like an empty bag or empty hole and it is useless. So to recharge the groundwater, what we do is a simple technology because uh, groundwater recharge is a very big term in uh, technic uh, technology world, but it can be done with less than $10, what we've been practicing in few countries. What we do is uh, we, use a, uh, we use a pipeline, we conduct that pipeline and connect in the borehole. We just make a borehole, a hole in the borehole and then collect all the water and make sure that water goes inside and uh, to, uh, to give a clean water, what exactly what we do is using a mud filter. So it's not a rocket science, just using a mud filter, adding some sand in it, it cleans the water and give you six pH minimum to drinkable water. So this is a simple low cost technology and simple practices, which can be adopted anywhere. And uh, I can share a video after this call so that uh, like our team members and our participants should know that how easy it is and how easy it can be adopted anywhere in any environment. If we just require a rainwater and to catch it. So yeah. this is one good practice is uh, what I'm doing in uh, Southern Africa and in India and in Nepal. So I would like to elaborate more on the projects and uh, discussion on that but I'll give the opportunity to the other speakers uh, constraining the time. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Nihal. So our next uh, guest is Professor Mohamed Fordus. So Professor Mohamed Ferdous is an expert in youth leadership and rights-based responses to humanitarian crisis. Mohamed Ferdous is the coordinator and lecturer of the postgraduate programs in disaster management at Brack University in Dhaka and a co-principal investigator of synthesizing evidence from non-health sectors to inform health system responses to humanitarian displacement the Rohingya and Bangladesh project of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Along with this, Produce is the principal investigator of the project of the World Food Programs Bangladesh. Let's give it up for Professor Mohammed. Uh, thank you, Charlie. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, but I can see my picture is uh, completely blur. Uh, it's okay. Is it? Is it? Yes, it is. Um, uh, yeah. Let me try to. 
it's okay. I will I will continue my um, introduction to our next who's, who's going to be joining us for this discussion. It's um, Mrs. Merle Barlaan. It's our she's our international vice president, chief administrative officer, and director of the WFWPI office for UN relations in New York. She is a peace and environmental advocate specializing on women, youth, and community development, promoting a holistic leadership of heart approach. She has played an active role in the United Nations NGO community for 25 years. She graduated with baccalaureate in education from the International Peace Leadership College, Rizal, Philippines. She is a grad writer with certification in philanthropy and fundraising in New York University. Thank you for joining us as well, Mrs. Merle Barlaan. So now our, yes, now our panel is complete and I hope everyone's, um, yeah, everyone's excited. So we have two topics um, for this discussion. The first topic will be about climate change as an existential threat to humanity. Does anyone wants to start? Okay. Uh, I think there are some technical problems. That's why I cannot. Uh, I, I also send uh, <clears throat> another request uh, through, jo to, uh, through joining through online. And other than this meeting is being recorded. Yeah, I think, uh, I Professor think, uh, Muhammad, it's okay if you don't use the virtual background. Um, yeah. Yeah, you can go ahead. As long as we can hear you, it's fine. Do you want to share? Um... Okay, there you are. Okay. Yeah. If you could please unmute yourself. Okay. Okay, finally. Finally, thank you. Thank you very much that I returned uh, safely. Uh, okay. I was in uh, like the art. I don't know where I was, but <laughs> I finally I uh, overcome the problem. And it's, uh, uh, I really enjoy uh, uh, Dr. Nehal or Dr. Uh, my presentation or the discussion that he started with a nice quote, very nice quote of the UN Secretary General. But um, at the, I, I would like to share or, or one thing regarding the um, regarding the climate change impact and the permaculture. Um, if you know about the Rohingya uh, crisis in the in the uh, South Asian part, uh, you will understand better how is important the uh, permaculture and the uh, uh, uses of land and uh, how, what is the uh, impact that uh, people are facing here in, in Bangladesh, uh, even though in the whole South Asian country, the impact uh, is, is giving to the Rohingya refugee crisis or the Rohingya movement. Uh, that's completely, completely uh, destroyed a part of our country, uh, mostly like the hilly area they are uh, completely uh, destroyed all of those uh, forests and, and uh, that place are now a uh, place for living uh, people where that place was completely or uh, dedicated only for elephant and some other reserve uh, animals. Uh, but now people are uh, like the human being are living um, in the a specific place or the reserve place for, for animals. So uh, as as uh, more than 10 million people, uh, 12 million people, they shipped or uh, moved uh, from uh, Rakhine to uh, Bangladesh and uh, in the southern part of the country now uh, occupied uh, by a uh, host people. Still the government or, or the ministry um, or the international body not recognizing that uh, Rohingya uh, as a refugee. They are, we are still uh, considering them as forcefully displaced citizens of Myanmar. That means they are still guests uh, and we are hosting them 
uh, and we are not giving them any uh, complete status like the full status of the refugee and just because uh, because of the international um, scenario or the international movement uh, we cannot give them the uh, as we don't have the uh, sign uh, refugee hosting sign uh, with the un council so therefore we cannot give the status of a refugee hosting uh, in, in in a very small cat or tiny country or um, still is the overpopulated country so we cannot host um, like the more than 10 million people uh, from some other country so we are considering them as a forcefully displaced citizens or or guest in our country so what they are doing uh, or using their land in uh, in that area they are mostly using their uh, their uh, top of their house uh, like rooftop or or they are uh, like a corner of their house just a, a very tiny place which is uh, they are uh, using and their washroom and other and that place they are uh, trying to crop some uh, new fertilization or, or new crops that they bring that they bring that they bring therefore they can therefore they are using that land for for their uh, food supply or their, for their uh, regular life and uh, there's on impact that we are directly faced and we uh, directly uh, uh, got the uh, impact of uh, environmental environmental or the uh, migrant uh, crisis another thing is the so uh, southern part another part of the country or the coastal part of country in bangladesh uh, the world largest uh, cities we have you know and the world largest mangrove we have we call uh, the world largest cities we call the cox's bazaar and another opposite of that uh, we call the world largest mangrove uh, that's called sundarban where uh, where mostly that was natural or or still is natural but uh, due to climate change effect due to climate change impact uh, that area sometimes they uh, over flooding uh, due to due to uh, water raising the over flooding some of those area is completely um, um, like destroy or or completely uh, stories for uh, next 10 to 50 10 to 20 years uh, uh, like farmer are not able to fertilize any any crops over there because the rice that that was used to uh, farming or the uh, cultivating in in that area that rice or the that crops are not uh, uh, used to or not not uh, adapted with the uh, culture with the with the land that um, saline water due to saline saline water so if any uh, plant or if any area uh, is affected by the saline water and uh, that duration maybe the flood duration maybe uh, five days or ten days or or fifteen days mi minimum if it is minimum five days then uh, that land or the that mud adopt that water uh, in a uh, certain level and uh, due to that due to uh, adopting that certain level uh, uh, like the sea water or the salinity water then the regular farming or the regular rice fertilizing or 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 uh, some other regular fertilizing like fruit or others uh, that cannot crops anymore uh, over there so how people are living or how people are um, fulfilling um, or filling out their uh, local food demand uh, they it's are, seven o'clock they, they are trying to uh, introduce with new uh, rice that the rice research institute are working for that issues and uh, they find some new solution which can maybe after five years like uh, that rice can adopt in in that area then they they will be able to maybe maybe grow uh, there or use their land it's a very big or very big area in the in the coastal in the southern part of the country and that completely unusable wow so, so there are there are several things that uh, impacted by due to climate change uh, effect in Bangladesh, but I, I just mentioned two things that are very large scale and uh, internationally that uh, considerable uh, people are talking about. Yeah.
I yeah. think I took a uh, lot of time. Yeah. I, yeah, I think um, permaculture is universal. Like, you can, I, I just realized right now how we can, you know, the, we can build back better by applying the permaculture practices by um, regenerating or transitioning the communities to be able to produce its own crops. Because it's really hard. I've, I've ha I have friends who are who came from refugee camps and who are working with refugees from Iraq. So I really feel for um, Rohingya, for Rohingya. Um, it's hard to be in that position. What do you think, Atimurli? What do you think should be done? Like, I think this is something that we can actually explore, fund for our GFG. Fund, fund by the G, funded by the GFG option. Well, there are, permaculture actually is, uh, it's universal. And uh, one thing that makes permaculture applicable in any level is even if you have just a few, few acres, just not even an acre, um, just within your backyard or, you know, um, a con a small spaces, you can apply it. And um, I think that it's just a matter of understanding how nature works and working with nature, um, that understanding that principle to start with will make a big difference. Um, yeah, uh, what do you think, uh, Dr. Nihal? You have been working with governments and civil society uh, as consultant, and in terms of um, bringing these solutions into our communities and, and having governments support it, uh, how do you, what do you recommend? Okay, first, uh, I would like to acknowledge the uh, the challenges what uh, Rohingya refugee is facing in uh, Bangladesh. And uh, I visited uh, all the refugee camps. I was there in Cox's Bazar and uh, uh, as an observer team from UNDGC. And uh, so uh, I had an opportunity to be there. And uh, so uh, I knew I had seen the situation, what life they are living. It is very challenging for an, a developing country to host more than a million refugees, which is the biggest refugee camp in the world. And uh, so there are many humanitarian agencies came together, and uh, but still the challenges is vast. And permaculture can be a great solution for them. And uh, there are many humanitarian agencies who are working in their capacities, but uh, uh, producing food for them will be a great achievement because uh, like every country have its own challenges. And... Uh, uh, and supporting the other country, and especially like a country like Bangladesh, with who themselves they are a victim of climate changes. And uh, if uh, if you uh, if you know that recently they had a massive flood in uh, western part. If I'm wrong, then just uh, correct me. But uh, it it was a massive flood and destroyed thousands of lives. So uh, with with their own challenges the country hosting so many refugees or uh, probably internally displaced people from Myanmar is another challenge for Bangladesh. So implementing uh, permaculture to uh, this Cox Bazaar reason can be a great idea. And uh, we can collaborate with uh, multiple agencies like World Food Program is very actively working there. BRAC, the university uh, professor comes from is one of the major stakeholder supporting uh, the refugee uh, uh, in uh, Bangladesh, and uh, uh, they are the major stakeholder in uh, in terms of research, in terms of development, in terms of uh, strategies. So they are directly uh, negotiating with the government. So professor can be a great resource for us. And uh, uh, then there are uh, UNHCR is working in the region. So uh, WF WPI can uh, play an uh, important role in uh, implementing permaculture in that region. Thank yes, you. definitely. Yes, yes. It brings me back to the video, Yanni's video, um, problem, turning problems into solutions, healing people through nature, healing nature through people. I can't imagine being in a refugee camp without any, any staple food, anything that can sustain you. 
throughout the day or throughout the week, throughout the month. So it's, it's very important for us to explore these um, regenerative food systems, which will bring us to our next topic. So our next topic is about best practices in sustainable and regenerative food systems. Well, that would be a perfect question for uh, Professor Mohammed. Um, do you know of any permaculture projects or initiatives in Bangladesh that we can expand on? Uh, yeah, uh, I know. So I know few of them, uh, like the eco cooperation. Uh, that's mostly work with the nature, uh, nature based solution, or uh, IUCN. Uh, IUCN mostly they are preserving the forest. Uh, mostly, mostly they are protecting animals. But the um, eco cooperation and new organization is called um, uh, is called Sensory, I think, uh, based in US or the funded by US. They are working on the permaculture, uh, even though not even uh, not only the Rohingya camp, uh, they are also working uh, in the in the Western part of the country, like uh, it's called Shatkira, where uh, several times happened uh, different kind of natural disaster, like the cyclone. Uh, there are a big cyclone happened few, uh, like in 2009, there happened in 2009, uh, 25th of March uh, happened a very big cyclone. Uh, uh, it's called Cyclone Isla. Uh, that area they are trying to promoting um, the permaculture. Uh, because that you, that area are not uh, able to use uh, for their regular uh, uh, regular fertilizing. Uh, also for the Rohingya, that I know some organization, including like the Professor Nehal uh, already mentioned that uh, Dr. Nehal already mentioned that the BRAC itself or themselves they are are uh, uh, leading uh, to a specific camp like no other organization like UN, UNSCR or any other body, any other international or national organization are not not even though interrupting them or or, or involved in that uh, two camp uh, so uh, that that called model camp uh, like the very big uh, uh, or the large large amount of people are living in in those camp uh, and that area is completely uh, um, uh, under control by BRAC and that area is uh, promoting the permaculture uh, through throughout the they give the the camp uh, camp area is a specific uh, with a uh, open space we call open space that open space was um, uh, very beginning was uh, uh, dedicated for kids over there that kids are uh, for their playground or or, uh, or other thing and the school area but uh, they also separated that area because of the additional refugee camps and and they need um, extra or additional land then they separate that land and uh, they are using their uh, rooftop or their uh, schools uh, additional place to permaculture uh, and their regular uh, regular using like the vegetables and other fruits that they need because they are not uh, uh, as you know like more than 6.25 million people are there uh, in in a very tiny place and they completely uh, destroyed the forest. That that's I'm uh, using that uh, on sentence uh, several times. They completely they destroyed the forest, which was uh, dedicated for uh, a specific animal like uh, um, uh, like uh, elephant. Mostly that area was dedicated for elephant. So that area, uh, when they cut that area, then. Um, you, you know, like the if the if, if you for, cut the forest, then uh, there will be a like the solid mud, and the so if heavy rain comes, then the solid mud will uh, will be a, a several times landslide because of the uh, because of the uh, heavy rain. So to controlling that or to controlling their um, uh, rooftop um, or or through the to go to saving their uh, heat. Uh, so they are promoting the permaculture in that area so that they giving them uh, several safety measure to uh, to uh, further extension or or using that land whatever they have and uh, maybe maybe they can uh, 
they are not able to use that land only for rice cultivation or other thing but they are using that land for for some fruits or uh, some vegetables or or they need regular uh, life i have so a that's question for uh, please I have a question for, for both uh, Dr. Nihal and for, for you, Professor Mohammed. How possible is it for a permaculture to be institutionalized, like being taught as one of the course in the university and, and also uh, Dr. Nihal for governments to subsidize and, and promote that as a social program? It is quite possible. and. Uh... A permaculture is a good practices which is adopted, I guess, across the globe. But now the challenges, uh, uh, like uh, these, are taught only through uh, through an uh, individual or an institution. But it is not recognized by university. Probably there may be some university who already recognize like agricultural universities. But if we make a proper modules and uh, with uh, uh, with uh, the questionnaires and with the challenges and and overall practices and how it is helping in mitigation. And if we have a, a proper module, then definitely we can approach it first to UNAI to recognize as a impactful project for uh, development strategies and alternative farming, and then a good and best practices what you've been doing in past uh, can be highlighted with the government and then can be negotiated with uh, with the perspective of civil society development and can utilize in every corner of the world, especially uh, the region which we're talking about, Cogs Bazar. It is much needed there because very limited, as as Professor said, that they have a very limited space and more than 12, one and a, uh, 12 million people living in, I guess it, it's just uh, a land of 50 acres. And so uh, they are surviving like an insects. And so, yes. so the, the space is very limited. And so the permaculture can play a good role in uh, for them to at least get a food resource okay. support. Okay. And as Mr. Pro, um, as uh, Professor is here, we can definitely discuss on uh, uh, adopting uh, an idea of permaculture into a module or uh, in, a, in a university level education. Thank you. That's really, that's what I wanted to hear. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Nihal. Uh, how yeah, about that's, you? That's a, Go ahead. That's, uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nihal. Uh, I really appreciate it. And sometimes I even, uh, I try to share that uh, knowledge uh, with my students. Uh, I mostly teach in a master's program. So I share to uh, not a specific uh, Rohingya or the Cox's Bazar area, even though you know uh, that you mentioned that uh, very large or the very big flood in the South Asian context that we are facing now. So people, people lost everything, whatever they have or whatever crops they have in their, in their um, house. So they lost each and everything. So after impact, I am also starting a new research so with my students, how they can, uh, after the flood effect, you know, after the flood effect, uh, that land actually uh, so valuable as, uh, as it is uh, not, um, not uh, saline, water, saline water. Uh, is as it is a sweet or, uh, water so maybe maybe they can use their land for next two years for fertilizing or, or introducing new crops and that area will be so uh, good resource or, or that uh, or their uh, house area will be a very valuable for next uh, two to five years because after flood uh, when the uh, flood come then they take some um, additional uh, value or the water uh, that come with uh, several, um, uh, like the several, um, like the uh, chemical, not not the chemical water, like the that mud, uh, maybe one one inch or two inch mud that uh, work as their uh, uh, at the, uh, as a fertilizer for their uh, another crops. So they are promoting, or we are trying to promote that uh, through our research with uh, another organization uh, called Eco Corporation, because they are Eco Corporation uh, is, uh, working with uh, 
uh, card aid, uh, both organization work for the nature or, or <clears throat> work with the natural solution. So we are, uh, we invite uh, the country director of this organization to uh, trying to some new solution for that people are affected in the Asil head area. Um, and also um, uh, trying to give some solution for the uh, through a UNDP project. I remember that I uh, uh, give, their, uh, give them some recommendations uh, through the <clears throat> WFP, um, like on years, uh, on years back to using their land, whatever they have, um, to giving them the regular food as a relief, uh, rather than give some seeds, uh, which seeds is, uh, is, is uh, usable in the hilly area, in their, uh, in their uh, living place. So we recommended uh, through, a, a consult, through a consulting or through some recommendation uh, document uh, to the WFP and the UNDP. So I work another with uh, another uh, along with another professor from University of Dhaka. Mm -hmm. So we give them a solution or or some recommendation like uh, you are providing foods regularly. That's that's very good. But uh, also you should give them some seeds which can um, a good solution for their longevity and they can uh, do some uh, work there. You know. Um, the people, Rohingya people, they are they are uh, just uh, living in their house. I think uh, Dr. Nahel know uh, they are just living in their home and they don't have to do anything. They cannot do anything even. Uh, they are just living their uh, uh, house and they are uh, collecting that relief from the UN and the other uh, donor organization. They are uh, providing like weekly uh, food or the monthly food uh, just by just. Uh, through a uh, card uh, they, they have. Mm -hmm. So they are just uh, living there and uh, just sleeping and, and uh, another day uh, they come. So they don't have to do anything. Uh, so we suggested to use that resource or use that manpower to do something uh, which maybe they cannot earn uh, out of that. Uh, there are some restriction uh, through the government or through the international body even. They cannot earn or they cannot go out uh, of that camp. So how they will live there how, or what will be their, uh, like the, you know, they are living a standard is very minimum. They are, maybe they are getting uh, three meals, uh, two meals in a day. Um, maybe maybe they need uh, four times meals, but they are using that two time meals for, for three times. So there are lots of shortages, uh, food shortages over there. And because of the funding limitation from the UN agency, even though now uh, some international organization or the UN agency are leaving uh, just uh, because it's, it's almost uh, five to six years or five years. So UN have some limitation. They cannot uh, uh, serve for, for, uh, for a long while uh, uh, because they have uh, some time limitation. So now they are trying to host or, or giving that responsibility to the local organization. We call it localization. So uh, through that localization, uh, people are uh, getting trained uh, that new addition can be that permaculture that we are discussing here. So they are uh, getting train, um, training to, uh, in, in different skill, like maybe uh, for handicraft, uh, for some other uh, local uh, cultivation. But this thing or, or, or these the permaculture things can be added uh, in, in, uh, in, in very high level promotion or the very um, uh, formal way uh, that I'm feeling now. Uh, just uh, we have limitation, land limitation. Uh, Dr. Nehal already mentioned that the, uh, only 15 uh, to 20 acres sometimes is considered, but uh, that according to the land limitation, uh, we cannot uh, cross uh, several kind of um, vegetables there or other thing. We can use what's most uh, functional or what's most needed in uh, for for that uh, specific people or for that reason that we can promote. Uh, we need a uh, very specific uh, research on that. What can be helpful for that people who are living over there? Yeah, I very much agree with Professor Mohammed. It's so important to have uh, the skills training on the ground. Obviously, the United Nations um, doesn't have unlimited resources. So it's very important to empower 
the people, the community in those refugee camps to be able to sustain themselves, to be able to, you know, to deliver what they need on the ground. Because it's, re it, you know, the way it goes, like giving food, giving money or giving, just giving, like, and they're taking. So it's, it's not sustainable. And it reminds me of our, um, our former um, project, our, our, our past project, the Sustainable Village Incubator in Bohol that was, um, that was a skills training for um, 50 women from the five poorest town of, towns of Bohol. And I believe that really helped the women uh, to empower themselves to be able to sustain their families. And that could also um, very much uh, assist the, the refugees, the Rohingya refugees, if we implement permaculture literacy and practice project. Am I right, Ademirli? Yes, you are right, Chuck. Yes, Thank we're you. very much, I think this is going to extend, this discussion is gonna, gonna extend. And I very much believe that there's a lot of things to do underground. And I mean, it's, it's so overwhelming to hear all these experiences, you know, to hear these um, these are experiences, actual experiences from grassroots level. Nobody, you, you won't be able to find people ready to share stories straight from Bangladesh, from, from India, and from, you know, wherever you are. So this is a very important um, event, Impact Friday event, where everyone can hear stories of impact, people who are working on the ground tire tirelessly. And for that, I wanted to um, plug in our uh, Giving for Good project. So Giving for Good project, uh, this year's theme is Healing Our Home, Our Shared Calling. So basically, it, this project actually empowers each one of us to take ownership of, of um, over healing the planet, our home. And as you can see, you don't actually need to donate um, money, actual money. You, you just have to, you know, look inside your closet. If you wanted to donate something valuable, you could, you can always um, email us, contact us if you have something valuable that you wanted to donate. So that's, that's very empowering because sometimes people think that, oh, I don't have money. I can't, I can't help people. I, I barely have anything in my pocket, but like we all have all we all have clothes, clothes that probably we didn't, you know, like it's not trendy anymore, but it could be valuable. So I invite everyone to get involved, um, bid our auction. Our auction kick starts on July 7th, 17th and comes off on July 31st. You can join our virtual event fundraiser that's going to be on July 29th. Or if you are in New York, you might as well bump, bump on any one of us. And we're very much happy to welcome you at the New Yorker Hotel. We have an in-person showroom um, from July 30, 30th to 31st. So I invite everyone to be creative in, in healing our home taking ownership of the responsibility um, of healing our planet, our home, the only home that we have, unless you wanted to migrate to Mars. But um, kidding aside, I wanted to, um, there are familiar faces um, in our participants. If you have any questions, you can always, um, you, you can speak out right now, or you can drop your questions in the chat box. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. Just, just a small correction, like the, till now that uh, through the Al Jazeera uh, report uh, in Rohingya camp, they took uh, 8,000 acre land, 8,000 acre forest they destroyed. 8,000 acre forest, uh, which was a uh, reserve forest for elephant. And there are several camps are now uh, increasing because you know the Rohingya people, they have one agenda to uh, increase their population even though they are not uh, listening or, or they are not uh, uh, they are not in that place they are not any any 
birth control uh, system or they are not following that any system just they want to increase the people to uh, be a uh, and like that they, they need more people to <clears throat> i don't know why um, they need more people for collecting food if if new baby born they, then they got uh, one food pack from wfp that's one reason another reason um, they want to be a frontliner uh, in next few years so there's something a, a very a big threat for the country in bangladesh so um, uh, even though like that a crop uh, cultivation over there, the new initiative uh, or the new uh, permaculture functionality that can be a good uh, solution. If you have any specific project or plan, then maybe there are some place or room we can work together. Yep, uh, I'm sorry, uh, just correction about the acre land that I mentioned previously. So I just uh, go through my research and I found that uh, it's 8,000 acre. I would yeah. like to add just a closing remark and uh, appreciated uh, that you corrected and I'm, I'm thankful to everyone, all the participant and organizer for organizing such an important event and uh, which is based on action. It's just not that we're talking now and uh, it's end, but this is a beginning of uh, the conversation to the action platform and uh, and uh, I am I'm sure that uh, the challenges what uh, Rohingya refugee camps and the Rohingya faces, there are multiple uh, refugees all across the globe. And we all are victim of nature because we created uh, this situation by taking away from the nature. So nature does not work with boundaries or uh, nature does not work with uh, uh, countries. So nature is nature. It's above us and below us. So it, it's our responsibility to respect them, to get a respect from them. This is all I would like to add. You want to Thank add you. Add you. Yes. Uh, yeah. My heart is full. I'm always hopeful. And I'm so grateful to meet uh, Dr. Nihal Mayor and Professor Mohammed Ferdows. Uh, yes. Yani Dota, the uh, founder of Regenesis, she created that video herself, actually. And, um, she works in, in Singapore, Singapore National University. She's actually a curriculum uh, the creator of, they work in the education area as well, her and her husband. I'm, I think her husband is from Bangladesh. I have to make sure, uh, but I will confirm. But I surely will connect you to Yani. And um, I, I believe that we have a powerhouse, yes, yes. The, for, the force to reckon with. And, and yeah, if we move forward mm -hmm. with heart and determination, I think we can reverse the existential threat and we can live peacefully, sustainably, and regeneratively. And and may and heal our home, mm -hmm. our shared calling. <laughs> thank yeah. you so much, and God bless everyone. Back to you, Chad. Yes, thank you so much, everyone. I I would like to um to thank my very good friends, Dr. Nihal and Professor Mohammed Perdus, and um, Miss Mrs. Murdy Barlaan. I am also my heart is full. And it's, it's really a great morning to start it with impact. So why not be, you know, there's always a way for, for problems to be turned into solutions. I mean, we are always creative in, in, in every single way. We try to be trendy. We try to do things we do. We paint or we sing, but there's only one home and that is our mother earth. So. Let's heal our home. That's our shared calling. This is Giving for Good Impact Friday signing off. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. Everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. Everyone. Thank you for inviting me within the short time. I don't know like the how the deliver was. Perfect. Uh, I try to share Thank the you. exact scenario here, what's happening. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Bye. Yeah,